female husbands. So this is a story, um, first of all, I had no idea before researching into this, right? And it's interesting to me, right? Because it's uh, all of this uh, labeling going around towards gender and how gender is uh, such a modern construct. We are in a summer night in 1837 when at a certain point a guy uh, gets stopped on the street. And the guy in question is George Wilson. He is drunk on the street, gets taken into police custody. We are in the Lower East Side in New York City. And the officer at the station starts doubting this is really a guy. Actually, this guy, or this seemingly looking guy, is actually a woman. But they have been married with a woman, with a wife. So. And by the way, they have been married for 15 years, okay? So at this point, the wife comes in, rescues the husband, says the truth, says that uh, yes, she's been married with this person for the last 15 years and the officers let them go. The history of people that transgender is not something that was just uh, the result of this century or the past few centuries. It is something that we actually find over and over in history. It is a, a history that is unknown, undiscovered, and talked about. Why? Because it's not that convenient. It's more convenient to politicize the issue, make it bipolar and as and a dichotomy, rather than to actually uh, trying to understand people. And the idea is here that um, there were at least three different groups in the 18th century um, that were groups of people that would transgender. One would be that of female sailors. One would be that of female soldiers. One would be that of female husbands. Now. Once you tell the story, you go like, well, hold on, the first two groups are not like the third one. Why? Well, the reason why would be that they transgender out of necessity because they were too poor and because they want escaped poverty because they didn't have a job or a family or because they had to provide it for one. But female husbands would be different. They transgender because they wanted to. And there's a whole argument that is important for historical reasons that um, if you um, feel like um, not belonging to the gender um, that was assigned to you at birth, that is not a behavior. That is not merely a behavior, but it is something that is there by nature. But also this argument, which is important because it prevents some from supporting the argument that um, is a behavior and as such should be corrected because of religious historical reasons that make no sense whatsoever. Um, there is a limitation in the argument that one is who it is because of nature, because of external forces that have decided that for you, because it eliminates the idea that you could choose to be who you want. It is this very principle that was um, defended so strenuously by Albert Gelf. Around 20 years later, in 1854 this time, another case showed up. And this time, this is the case of Joseph Lobdell. He became soon a local celebrity. Lobdell had a rough life and at the age of 25 had renounced to um, uh, his gender um, as female and had taken up the name of Joseph Lopta. Now, eventually he found a slice of happiness. Specifically, he had this relationship for 20 years with Marie Louise Perry. Now, when the newspaper told his story, told the story of somebody who uh, was born as a female and um, lived for 20, 25 years as a male, and that 
This was the result of social and economic pressures. The neighbors recounted a different story, that that was the result of their insanity. And basically, eventually, this was an argument that was so important in determining Lovedell's fate. The brother put him in an asylum. Lovedell defended the theory that this was his actual conscientious choice. This is a story that does not end well. He spent the rest of his life, first in one asylum, then in another. He will never come out alive. He will die in 1892, with the wife not being able, not being permitted to visit her husband. With a story where people's opinion determined who Lobdell was. He was insane for the people. And that is what the people ruled, and that is what the people determined. But you see it still nowadays, that some people are so concerned with who you are. They don't know, for the record, who they are, but they are so interested in your sexuality, so interested in determining who you should date, who you should marry, who you cannot have children with. This is philosophically a concept of biopolitics. It is when the state determines on a person's life. And there is always in every type of social contract a form of determination that the state has to make about people's life. But the question is really, isn't that time to restructure, reformulate the social contract. Isn't that the time to stop minding people's business and start minding their own? Because if you do need to figure out what other people can and cannot do, then maybe we should figure out first what you can, what you in the first person can and cannot do. Why do you think the state is there to restrict rights rather than to give rights, for instance? That is a question for you guys. So you know what to do. If you want to comment, to go ahead and comment below. And if you have enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. We're gonna talk next time in a new different episode. For now, that's it. Bye bye.